Of course, if you haven't done so yet, make sure that you pause the video and try to answer the question on your own first before listening on. The key to understanding this question is to realize that heat energy is going to flow from the warmer object, which in this case is lead, to the cooler objects, which in this case is copper, ice, and water. So we can symbolize that by drawing arrows showing that lead will lose some heat to copper, it will lose some more of its heat to water, and some of its heat to the ice. The next key idea is to understand that the amount of heat that is lost by this lead object will equal the amount of heat gained by the other objects. So we would have Q for the copper plus Q for the ice plus Q for the water. However, we must be careful here because if the lead is losing heat, that means its energy is decreasing, so this value would be negative. On the other hand, the other objects are absorbing heat, so their energies would all be positive collectively. But of course, we cannot set a negative quantity equal to a positive quantity. That wouldn't make algebraic sense. So in order to resolve that little dilemma, what we can do is stick a negative sign in front of the heat that is lost by the lead. And therefore, that negative sign, along with this negative sign, would cancel to make a positive on the left side, which would equal the positive on the right side. Now, for the lead, it's going to lose heat, and its temperature is going to drop down to 12 degrees. The expression we would use for that loss of heat and causing that change in temperature would be the following. It would be the mass of the lead multiplied by the specific heat capacity of lead, which we can look up, multiplied by the change in temperature for the lead. And we'll be able to calculate that relatively easily. Now, the other expressions are a little bit more intricate, especially the ice, as we will see. So let's actually bring this down here and make some room. Now, the heat gained by copper will actually look just like the expression for lead. The copper is going to raise its temperature from 0 degrees all the way up to 12. And since it's changing temperature, we would use the same expression. We would have the mass of copper multiplied by the specific heat of copper multiplied by its change in temperature. Now, for the ice, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Notice the ice is at 0 degrees Celsius, but then its temperature is going to rise all the way up to 12. And it turns out that that process will be broken up into two parts. The first part will be the melting of the ice. So the expression for melting looks a little bit different. We would have the mass of the ice multiplied by the latent heat of fusion. But then once the ice is melted, its temperature is still at zero degrees. So then that temperature will rise up to 12. Since that's an increase in the temperature, we would then use the other expression. We would have the mass of ice multiplied by the specific heat capacity of liquid water multiplied by the change in temperature. We should come back here and put a little I on here to indicate the mass of ice. Finally, you have the change in temperature of the water, which is going to go from 0 up to 12, so we'll use another mc delta t term. We're going to need even more room here. So let's slide this over, and finally for the water, we'll have its mass times the specific heat times the delta t. So all of those values will be for the water. Now, let's not forget what our goal is in this problem. It wants the mass of the lead. So we're looking for this value right here, which presumably means we know every other value, and we actually do. Let's look up some of these specific heat capacities. So here is a handy reference table we obtained from our textbook, the specific heat of lead. We can see is 128 joules per kilogram Celsius. The specific heat of copper is 387. The specific heat of water, liquid water that is, will be 4,186. Notice we don't need the specific heat of ice because the ice is going to melt and become liquid water. So we would use the specific heat capacity for the liquid water. 
So those are the values that we'll be plugging in for all of the C values. So we've plugged in all of those specific heats. Next, it might be helpful to plug in all of the known masses. We know the mass of copper. We have the mass of ice. So notice the mass of ice, that value will be placed, plugged in in the same spot twice. And then we have the mass of the liquid water. So let's plug those values in. Now please do notice that for the masses, which are indicated here, we did have to make sure that we converted them into kilograms. The reason for that is because the specific heat values are in terms of kilograms. So what we did is we took all three of the masses and we divided them by 1,000. So do make sure you convert the grams into kilograms by dividing by 1,000. And you can see that's what we have in those blue highlighted values. We're going to need to pick up the temperature changes for each object, so all of these delta Ts. For lead, remember the lead started out at 98 degrees and it's going to cool down to 12 degrees. So for the temperature change, you would simply subtract 98 by 12 and you would get, of course, 86. So the temperature change for lead will be 86. For copper, it began at zero degrees and warmed up to 12. So that temperature change would be 12. Same thing with the ice cube, it began at zero and warmed up to 12 degrees. And same thing with the liquid water. So we'll fill, all, uh, fill in all those temperature changes. Finally, we need to look up the latent heat of fusion for ice. And from a table in the textbook for ice or water, you look up the latent heat of fusion and you can see that it's this value and the unit is joules per kilogram. Again, it's in terms of kilograms, so it's good that we converted that mass into kilograms. So let's plug that in for LF. So we've gone ahead and have done that. I did catch one error for the temperature change of lead. It is true that its temperature changed from 98 to 12, so it cooled down. Therefore, the temperature change for lead should have been a negative 86. So just please make sure that you include a negative sign for that temperature change of lead rather than a positive 86. Now we multiplied all the values out on the right-hand side and added them together, and we ended up with 25840.08, and this would have come out in terms of joules because it's an energy. On the other side we have this negative sign along with the negative sign we just spoke of so those would cancel and 128 times 86 is 11,008. So we have the mass of lead times 11,008 and at this point the unit would be joules per kilogram. We would finally divide both sides of the equation by 11,008 joules per kilogram. And when, when we do that, we can see that the mass of lead turns out to be approximately 2.35 kilograms. So this would be the final answer.